Uh, contrary to popular platitudes, history is not written by the victors, but it's validated by the victims. By those whose silenced voices are vocalized by the eyewitnesses. Now, we can hear and we should heed the command to remember. Memory is essential, but it is not sufficient in itself. Our deference to memory must fuel our impetus to action. Anti-Semitism, especially as it relates to its ultimate destructive um, culmination in the Holocaust, is not simply a Jewish thing. It provides a precedent, a generative script that serves as a touchstone for the virus of virulent hatred. Never again? In reality, unfortunately, again and again. Cambodia, Bosnia, Rwanda, and most recently, just within the past 48 hours, I believe, uh, the official declaration of genocide by Daesh, which most American media call it Islamic State, in Syria. The terrible potential to harvest the genocidal fruits of hate lies not in some twisted souls, some warped minds, or, or misguided morals. The capacity to escalate hate to aid and abet persecution is a seed, a seed that lies fallow in all bystanders, and not just in the perpetrators. In people just like us, who sleep soundly in the confidence that, well, we could never perform such dastardly deeds, just as the professoriate said, in Germany, as they gladly acquired the positions that Jewish professors were no longer allowed to occupy. You see, we sleep soundly, and we sit idly by. You know, bigotry is disturbingly easy. Bigotry makes one feel big. Victimize others. So, at the same time, you can valorize yourself. After all, if all of our woes are due to the terrible Mexicans, the evil Muslims, those crafty Chinese, or whoever you like to point your finger at, then we bear no responsibility other than to wield the sword against them. Anti-Semitism, <coughs> anti-other, is convenient. Uh, we need not reflect on ourselves. We need not do anything. No, we, we need not do anything except blame. Blame those people, which in this case just happen to be Jews. You know, when I think about how to apply the Holocaust to the current times and to potential developments in the future, uh, I look directly to the lessons of survivors and listen to the survivors. And uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, quote and pick up uh, the lessons from two additional survivors. Uh, these two survivors are well, well known uh, throughout North Carolina over the years. Uh, the first is Morris Glass, who uh, is, is easily uh, the, uh, the most active, the true dynamo of uh, Holocaust survivor speakers these days in, 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 in North Carolina. He uh, is uh, amazingly active. And in every one of his presentations, in his memoir, in his testimony for the USC Shoah Foundation, he always says his basic line to remember, his lesson, 
I am my brother's keeper. What do we make of this? And I think that's exactly the question to ask. What do we make of this? What we make is that we cultivate a culture of care. How? The first counterweight to the power of hate is respect. Well, what does that involve? Well, it involves expanding our means of engagement, primarily approaching conflict with direct engagement, with the courage to argue and debate, not the cowardice of succumbing to the lure of violence and intimidation. Oh, that's easy. But we can do the hard work. As Zeb said, we can. And each of those we's is an I. Okay? So, is that enough? Well, not quite. Before we defend our right to bear arms, we must build our capacity to bear each other. But mere tolerance is a very low bar. Do you simply want to be tolerated? I think not. Instead, we cannot reward and glorify violence. This is what we're talking about by cultivating a culture of care, not reveling in the momentary pleasure of demeaning others. We must embrace alternatives that provide some outlet for emotional expression, for anger, for guilt, for frustration. Outlets other than victimization. Let us try to replace the weapons of war and the tools of oppression with tools of argument wielded in the form of debate. And when we say, oh, well, we're not going to discuss you know, politics or religion or anything controversial that might inflame the passions, we remain silent at our own peril by refusing to engage each other. You know, uh, it, it was uh, interesting that the title for this event uh, was From Persecution to Genocide. And reflecting on the phrase that my fine uh, the colleague uh, Carl Schlein is here, uh, really <laughs> popularized, I guess, it, on the twisted road to Auschwitz, a Auschwitz. The twisted road to Auschwitz, remember, was built brick by brick. It wasn't paved in one fell swoop. And the cumulative path of a little indign indignities that seemed insignificant at the time, but laid a foundation for estrangement, and then separation, and then marginalization, and then exclusion, and then extermination, can be stopped. Oh sure, at, at the moment it's very easy to go along and snicker at the racist meme that circulates about some famous African American. Or the comments uh, talking about the uh, questionable racial identity of someone. Or uh, demeaning someone because they do not conform to our own expectations of how people should look look or act to easily be pigeonholed into categories that we insist on enforcing. The question then becomes, how do we place roadblocks in the road to tomorrow's Auschwitz? How do we reroute our journey so that we do not retrace the path that terminates under that looming arch, reading Arbeit Macht frei. Morris makes one suggestion for what that alternative path might be. And the next suggestion comes from someone who unfortunately is no longer with us, but she definitely still has a presence. 
Uh, only about a year before she died, Gisela Abramson gave a presentation here at UNCG. Every time I would talk to Gisela, uh, she would correct me when I would say something about, well, you know, we're very interested in your story. She said, excuse me, professor. I must correct you. I must be the teacher, if you will bear with me. And you never said no to Gisela. <laughs> She said, Professor, this is not a story. I am my story. Take that seriously. Listen. Listen actively. Not simply as a spectator to an exciting emotional display. Listen to these stories. These stories live, and they live long after the lives of the survivors themselves. They live, as the Kaddish says, in the hearts of those who cherish their memories. These stories regenerate in our generations. We water the seeds that sprout both the perpetrators and those who might prevent them from perpetrating. I am my story, said Gisela. Yes, Gisela, and these are our stories. As the echoes of the living witnesses gradually recede into the past over the years, we revive their voices in each of our acts that digs potholes in the path to prejudice before it paves the twisted road to tomorrow's genocides. Each of us must also bear witness. And let us join Zev in affirming, I can. Thank you.